I'd like to call the May 15, 2012 meeting of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to order. The first item on our agenda is the minutes of our previous meeting, April 23, 2012. Does anyone have any comments on the minutes that have been circulated? I have one. Liza? And just that I was present. I don't think it has me listed as well. Ah. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. No problem. <laughs> any other comments? Do I have a motion? Victoria? Second? Okay. Motion made by Victoria and seconded by Peter. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. All set on that. Um, the first business item is Old Seapoint Road Subdivision Amendment. Elaine Zavodny Showquist is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Old Seapoint Road Subdivision to add a lot at the end of Old Seapoint Road under Section 1625 Subdivision Amendment. And this will be a public hearing tonight. So first I would ask the applicant to come forward and, and give us um, an outline of, of the things that have changed since the last time we've talked about the project. And we can go from there. Brief introduction, too. All right. Uh, so we, haven't, we haven't been. On, on air before, so just a general dis description also would be helpful. Okay. Uh, my name is Amy Bell Siegel. I'm a landscape architect with Terrence J. Dewan and Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Elaine so Showquist, right here on my left, and her husband Milos. Um, the changes, well, I think you described in, in, in brief. I'm going to pull the plan a little right. bit closer here. I can try to stay on mic here. Got a little bit of laryngitis. Um, when we came free before you before at the last meeting, we were proposing a single lot here, uh, which would include uh, the Schulquist existing home on a 2.32 acre lot. It would include uh, the frontage along Old Ocean House Road and all of the area that. Uh, they own within the road right, right away up to approximately here. And then the, the new lot would have access off of old um, Seapoint Road and include the, remaining, include the remaining land, which is about 6.47 acres. So that's the previous submission that we sent, we had before you. Since the last meeting, we've made the requested uh, note amendments to the plan and made some slight adjustments to the lot itself with the lot lines. Um, as you recall, we were out on the uh, site walk uh, and we sort of discussed some of these revisions and looked at the, the different layouts for the lot lines. So hopefully that, that's uh, somewhat fresh in your mind. So the changes that we've made since last time to the lot lines include adding all of Old Seapoint Road into the lot, all the land that they have in fee will now be in the lot, as well as modifying the northwest corner of that lot there, basically taking that 90 degree and making it an angle. So that's the only changes to the lot lines. Uh, we added a title block for signature. We added um, references to you know, the different lot numbers, um, map and lot numbers. We uh, added notes referring back to the 2007 approved plan, the last amendment to the subdivision. Um, I understand from reading Steve Harding's comments and Maureen's memorandum that some additional revisions need to be done to that to correctly uh, refer back to those 2007 plans. So you know, we will uh, take out this supersede note here and revise the note one as as Maureen outlined, that seemed pretty clear to us, so take care of that. Um, we did add the, under note one, the A, B, C, and D refer directly back to those 2007 improvements to Old Sea Point Road, which is basically to take that 12-foot wide driveway and increase it to an 18-foot travel way, which would put three-foot gravel shoulders on either side, 
and then rebuild um, approximately the first 350 feet to put a, a more adequate base, base underneath it, repave it. Also, some improvements to the intersection with old Ocean House uh, with uh, wider radiuses at the corners, extending the culverts, uh, moving the mailboxes, moving the street sign. So doing some of those improvements down there so that it was a, a better turning and uh, ease of access down here. Also, there'll be uh, a new uh, turnaround to town standards at the end here of the road, which is uh, basically between the Soquis and the uh, mills. And we looked at that area on the sidewalk. So those will be the, the upgrade to Old Sea Point Road that will occur um, with approval of this plan. We also added a note that referred to uh, the access for this new lot off of Old Sea Point Road. And um, I think, you know, after the site walk, Elaine had some real sort of, uh, you know, kind of aha moments that it just seemed so, uh, that the possibility of a road, you know, big wide road right in the back of the house was unsettling to her. So she wrote that memo that we then included in the package that just expressed her concern about that. Um, I understand from reading Maureen's memo that, um, you know, that the board would still like to, you know, discuss the, uh, the access off of there. So I don't know if, Elaine, if you want to speak more to that or? Sure, sure. Elaine would just like to speak a little bit about that directly. Since she wrote the memo, I thought it was more appropriate for her to respond sure. to that. Sure. Okay. Uh, just two quick things. Wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of you for coming up for the site walk a couple of weeks ago. And I particularly appreciate you sticking around for an extra half hour and walking up over the ridge line so you really got a sense of the uh, topography of, of the site. So thank you for doing that. And um, since writing that letter to um, Terry and Amy, um, we have had some meetings, uh, the three of us, and they um, have encouraged me to keep all of our options open. And um, even though I still feel, and I hope most of us do, that the most natural access to the uh, newly created site and the least destructive would still be off of Old Ocean House Road, um, I am uh, withdrawing my request to um, prohibit access off of Old Sea Point Road. Um, so I leave that on the table as an option. And then the only uh, other two items that we have um, just to comment on is uh, the access and maintenance agreement. At the last meeting, the board uh, requested to see a copy of that. We supplied that to Maureen. We also supplied a letter from um, the applicant's attorney, Melissa Hanley Murphy from Perkins Topkins, with the review. You know, she reviewed those, uh, the indenture agreement and said that it did indeed uh, provide legal deeded access to the newly created lot as well as obligate that lot owner to bear some of the costs for maintenance and repair of the road. So, um, and I believe the town attorney has looked at that and concurred. So that issue should be all set. And then the escrow account, um, Elaine has been working with uh, the man town manager on that. And I, as I understand, that's sort of, sort of taken care of and kind of ready to go um, depending on how the board proceeds tonight. So set. Okay. Enough information. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone on the board want to ask a question before we open the public hearing? Okay. Seeing none, I will now open the public hearing. If any member of the public would like to speak, please come forward and give us your name and address. Anyone here tonight to speak on this topic? No one? Okay, seeing no one on this matter, the public hearing is closed. So it is open to board members for any questions or comments. Um, Victoria. The only question I have is I did hear the applicant say she would, they would be removing this note. Does that also need now to be put into um, the conditions as everything else that's being addressed is in the conditions? I heard her say it, but it's not. By this note, can you read the beginning of it so we all know which one you're talking about? It's the note directly below the signing block, directly above the title block. This plan supersedes? Yes. Okay. 
Would that still need to go into the conditions? Yeah, okay. I'm seeing Maureen saying yes. So I'd like that to go into the conditions. Maybe make it number seven and make number seven number eight. Or you could um, just expand uh, proposed condition number three. The note two and the note above the title block. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else have any comments? Oh, um, yeah, I have a question about um, now the fact that Old Sea Point Road is bordered by lot 182 and, and not 185. 185 doesn't have direct access, you mentioned, on, to Old Sea Point Road in the new plan. It does. It, this is the 50 foot right of way, so this lot will continue to have frontage on Old Sea Point Road. Okay. Well, my question is, yeah, do you need some sort of easement in order to do that? No, you don't, because that's the red way. The red way is the same color green as lot 18, too. Is that right? Right. Well, this, this land is owned in fee right now uh -huh. by the Shoquists, so yeah. this is, they will continue to own it, but right. they will have access over this road in this 50-foot easement to gain access to their lot. Okay. They essentially have frontage on this 50-foot wide private road right of way. And so my question is, do we need something more than just this wording emergency access easement in here? That emergency access easement only refers to this area oh, down okay. here where the turnaround is. Yeah. I guess it's more of a question for Maureen, a technicality. I, uh, do, the, do we need to see something on the plan that says that lot 18.5 has access to Old Take a look Port at Road. note two. Yeah, if you. Um, I thought that that was going to be struck. Well, well, I mean, depending on Not what. Not in its entirety. Right. Okay. We would, you know, compose that. Um, it just ends the first sentence is the only sentence. Okay. So it would re read the owner of lot 18 5 has deeded right of access to Old Sea Point Road, period. And then not put the conditions on whether or not it would be. You know, there basically there wouldn't be any prohibitions on the type of access. Okay, great. Thank you. So could you, Peter? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Could you just clarify the last point that the applicant made about dropping the concern about using that? Access? Well, initially the note, as it's worded now, says upon this approval, such access may be used to connect to a driveway or private access way and utilities, but not as a street as defined by the town ordinance. And um, understanding that that would be a concern, uh, you know, they've decided that they won't prohibit it being used as a, for a, t a street as it's defined. And the street, as I understand, is a private or public road, you know, with a full 50-foot easement, those things. So accessing potentially more than one lot. So you now contemplate that the access to the lot 18 Dash five or wherever it comes could be down Old Sea Point Road. It, it could be, but as Elaine mentioned, you know, it's we still frontage off of Old Ocean House that, you know, we feel is so we'll, less we'll than the Correct. Correct. Um, just a question. Right, will you be going through the conditions? Because we had some, we had a question about one of those notes. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Do you want me to just okay, ask the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, the condition number one was the restriction that uh, lot 18 5, uh, that the deed for that would prohibit vehicular access off of Route 77. Um, and we're okay with that one. Um, number two, the note that talks about um, that no building permit be issued for lot 18 5. Uh, which allows the placement of a building that would not preserve a 50-foot right-of-way at the northerly frontage with Old Ocean House Road that extends from Old Ocean House Road to the rear a minimum distance of 525 feet. And as we understand, this came up from the site walk, that you know, we have a narrow area here, and someone could potentially put a house here, and that might make it more difficult to get access back there. So I understand the provision is to make sure that a 50-foot right-of-way area would be maintained here. Not that we have to draw it on the plan, but that 
a house would not be sited in a way that would preclude the possibility for a 50-foot right-of-way to come back here. So that, in, in essence, means that there would be no houses here in this small, narrow strip because you wouldn't have the setbacks from, you know, that you would need. So I, but the question that we have about that specific note is that if this lot was to be combined with this lot in the future, um, to 18-5 being combined with 15-B, would that note then go away? Because we wouldn't want that restriction on it in the future. It might not make sense depending on the design. Well, let's say that you or, or some other property owner, because you know we're, that's what yeah. we really need to plan for, so right. whoever comes forward right. with both those lots, right. and you had an idea to put your access somewhere else, um, you could always at that point amend this plan and remove that note. It's, it's a note on the plan. Right. And when you come in with a full development, that's when some of these nodes can come off plans because you now have shown us what your full build out design is. Does that so, make sense? Um, yes. So, uh. so let's say, for example, you know, somebody, developer or uh, property owner X, comes in and um, finds a lovely location on the northern lot, not on this lot to put in a road and then you turn this frontage into a house lot. You could then, as part of the approval for the whole development, including the house lot, amend the note on this plan at the same time. It would be concurrent. Okay. Where it would come off because we now know where the access is going to be and it's no longer something that's so critical. Okay, so that would be an amendment to this existing subdivision again? It would be done or would just be part, part of it, that? Part okay. of, yes. It would just be a And the board has handled it. that several more than one time. We've had, you know, projects that develop out of other projects and everything gets amended at the same time. Okay. It doesn't hold you up. You would have to create another plan, just like this plan, so there's that one added cost, but everything happens at the same time. Right. Okay. All right. So we would revise this plan and then submit the new plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, we, uh, we're all set with the rest of those conditions as they read uh, in, with the additional one. Okay, I, I have a question on condition three. Your proposal is to use all on uh, note number two to stop with the first sentence only. So Correct. not say your note here, Maureen, suggests that only these final words be removed, they're proposing to just take out that entire sentence, which probably is a cleaner way to do it. Is that all right with you? So. Okay, so that condition would be no, to eliminate the second sentence. Okay. okay. And the rest of the conditions are, are acceptable. Yep. Yep. We will uh, run the note one by Maureen again, just to make sure that that's worded correctly. No. Is there a question on note one? No. No, there isn't. But I'm okay. just saying, if you know, I can send it back to you. We, like we'll, like we said, we'll we'll remove this supersedes note here above the title block, and amend this to refer to it the way Maureen has worded it here made sense to us. So. And, and I just want to clarify for the board that um, under item five, uh, that's really there as, as a placeholder. The uh, applicant and the town manager have been in conversations and, and the escrow account is in process. It's common practice for the actual administrative portion of that kind of thing to happen by staff. Right. So that's, but that absolutely is, is moving ahead. Great. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Anyone like to make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion. I'm taking a very good note. Motion for the board to consider finding of facts that Elaine Zavodna Sarquist is requesting an amendment to the previously approved and amended Old Sea Point Road subdivision to add a lot at the end of Old Sea Point Road, which requires review under Section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance. Number two, the planning board finds that the full range of options for vehicle access to the adjacent land should remain available 
to promote public safety. Number three, improvements to Old Sea Point Road to upgrade it to town private road standards should be undertaken as soon as possible to promote public safety. Number four, payment of the open space impact fee will help preserve the community standards of open space. And number five, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of a lane of Adnia Sarquis is requesting <coughs> an amendment to the previously approved and amended Old Sea Point Road subdivision to add a lot at the end of Old Sea Point Road be approved, subject to the following conditions. Number one, that a restriction be added to the lot 18-5 deed that prohibits vehicle access from Route 77. Number two, that a note be added to the plans that no building permit be issued for lot 18-5, which allows the placement of a building that would not preserve a 50-foot wide right away at the northerly frontage with Old Ocean House Road that extends from Old Ocean House Road to the rear, a minimum distance of 525 feet. Number three, that a note two be amended to eliminate uh, the second sentence. Number four, that note one be amended to revise, replace note number eight on the 2007 plan with requires that all street improvements included on the 2007 subdivision approval are added to this plan by reference, a summary of which is highlighted below. Number five, that an escrow account in the amount acceptable to the town engineer and a form in amount acceptable to the town manager be established for all the road improvements. Number six, that the open space impact fee in the amount of $6,729 be paid. And number seven, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and all the above conditions satisfied prior to recording the subdivision plat. Do I have a second? Second. Carol Ann, any discussion? I believe that yes. you had wanted to change condition three so that after it said add not note two and the note above the title block. Yes, I did want to add that. Thank I you. Kind of hurt it. <laughs> and the note above the title block. Located above the title block, be removed. Okay. Okay. Now, Carol Ann, do you want to keep your second? Yes. Okay. Any comments or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Seven to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is Mojo Health Bar Site Plan Amendment. Jacqueline McClure is requesting an amendment to a site plan approval granted for 299 Ocean House Road in 1988 to change the use of 840 square feet from office to a combination of personal service and restaurant under section 19.9 of the site plan regulations. And Attorney General, Henry? Under the assumption that there could be conceived a conflict of interest. Sorry, under the possibility that it could be conceived as a conflict of interest, I wish to recuse myself from this particular uh, subject. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So if the applicant has a presentation, come forward. Thanks. Um, Start by introducing yourself and giving your address, please. Okay. My, um, my name is Jacqueline McClure. I live at um, 67 Leiden Lane East, Cape Elizabeth, and I'm here today for a site plan amendment for 299 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, currently, the um, premises is zoned for a Category 3 commercial, which is um, offices, and I would like to propose the change to a Category 5, which would allow me to have um, a juice and smoothie bar on the premises. I also plan to have um, two massage rooms, which are, um, I already have occupancy um, issued for the massage space, but I would like to um, be able to offer juice and smoothies not only to my clients, but also for public consumption. So that would 
mean the change of, um, uh, to the Category 5. The premises is located um, 299 Ocean House Road. On the map, it is um, it's right here. It's next to Coldwell Banker. Um, it's opposite, uh, it's actually opposite Key Bank, although that's not on here. Um, and um, it, it sits on a property that is um, also used for offices that's owned by the same, um, the, the same landlord. The property that I'm looking at is, um, it's about 840 square feet on two levels. And the building next door is, um, is about 1,500 square feet. So um, Mojo Health Bar, um, as I said, is a, would be a two-room massage therapy practice with a small juice bar offering four seats. Um, all my juices and smoothies are made fresh to order, as I said, for, for clients and public consumption. Um, I try to keep everything green, all my cups are biodegradable, um, so therefore there's no trash. And um, the only receptacles I need are for recycling. From, from, the, um, from the planning board workshop, you asked me to put the recycling bins onto the, um, the plan, which I have here. Um, they're labeled as the trash right here. They will be recycling bins, though. They sit on the edge of two parking spaces, so for easy access for removal um, for the recycling. Um, also, um, from the planning workshop, um, you asked about the, the parking calculations, which I have um, included in the packet. And currently, there are 12 parking spaces allocated for the, for the whole property, of which combined usage for Mojo Health Bar and the existing property next door, there would be a total of 10 spaces. Um, that, that gives two extra spaces um, for extra use. Um, and then the other um, requirement from the, from the workshop was for the confirmation of waste water flows. Um, I did have the engineers from um, Sebago Technics. They came out to take a look and, and did the calculations of which um, Robert Malley has now signed off with that. And I think you have a letter of his approval in your packet too. Um, the sign, I did um, apply for a sign permit of which um, I received back that the one existing sign on, currently on the road was, um, was um, permitted. Um, I am only allowed one sign to be placed on the building. So the sign at the back of the building that's in your packet that I've highlighted, I'll be with, withdrawing that application. And so it will just be Which one is the, 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 one, the one, oh yeah, sorry, the one at the bottom where it has the light attached to it. Um, so that, that will, that's being withdrawn and the application will go in for one sign to be on the building and I will conform to the city ordinance which is um, the sign can be no more than 40 square feet or 10% of the wall space, whichever is the smaller. So. Um, I'll be putting an application in for that. Um, I would still like to have a light, although I've been looking at lights, and my proposed light for that sign would actually be a solar-powered light that is a stake that goes into the ground and therefore is shining onto the, the sign itself. Um, and that light will sit three feet from the building, so seven feet from the boundary line. Can you point on the plan to mm -hmm. the sign that you're not going to? Oh, the sign right here is that I'm not, not, not going okay, to do. thank you. Anything else? No, I think I covered the, the points from the last meeting. So when you're, when you're talking about the light, Mm -hmm. Would the light be on the back of the building with no. the outside sign? The light would be on the side sign. The, the light would be on the side sign, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. Subject to whatever the sign ordinance permits about right. that. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. 
there are two stages to our discussion here. The first part is the question of completeness, whether we have enough material presented to us to consider the application. And we will be taking public comment both on the issue of completeness and if we decide that the application is complete, then subsequently on the merits of the application. Um, so I'd like to now open the floor to anyone in the public who would like to address the issue of completeness of this application. Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment period on completeness. Anyone on the board have questions with respect to completeness? Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Liza? Motion for the board to consider. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Jacqueline McClure for an amendment to the site plan approval granted in 1988 for 299 Ocean House Road to change the approved use from office to 840 square feet of combined personal service and restaurant be deemed complete. Do I have a second? second. Joe, seconded by Joe. Any further discussion on the question of completeness? All in favor. That is unanimous. Six in favor of a finding of completeness. So we can now move to the merits of the application. Um, and I will open the floor for public comment on the merits of this request. Any public comment on this request? Seeing none, I will close the public comment period. Members of the board, any questions or comments? I have a question. Joe. Um, I guess for Maureen, uh, is, is, would the change to Category 5 be permanent, or would it? Yeah. it I mean, the, the way I've always interpreted it is once you get the approval, it rides until you come back and change it to something else. Now, you could, um, the way we structure the town center regulations, we, we've tried to streamline them. If you were to move someplace else and someone wanted to move in there and um, operate a use that's lesser than a Category 5, they would not be required to come back to the board because it's a less intensive use so they could just operate their business. It's only when you convert to a more intensive category of use that you would be required to come back to the board. So going back to office is less intensive? Less intensive, so you could go back to office without coming before the board. The only thing that would um, change that is if you were going to make exterior changes to the building. So can you give us some examples of other uses that are in Category 5? Sure. Can I just take a moment? I'll pull that out. I believe that Category 5 is just restaurant. Oh, excuse me. Restaurants, including a delicatessen, ice cream parlor, and a sit-down restaurant. Now, you're giving approval, I believe, for four seats. So if someone wanted to operate a restaurant that had more than four seats, that would also be an expansion that would have to come back. Okay. In that four seats are the two seats outside mm -hmm. part of that four, so two inside and two outside. Is that or true? just four inside. Um, no, it would be, well, Two seats inside for massage clients to sit for waiting, which and count. which doesn't count in. So then two two seats inside for um, the juice and smoothie side, and then um, the seasonal two seats outside, but then seasonally bring them back in. So four seats inside. Four seats total. Okay. Yeah. So only f only a maximum of four restaurant yes. seats. Yes. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if I saw a signing block. Does there need to be a signing block on this? No? Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we don't require that site plans be recorded. Oh, okay. Thank you. I have a question about your status under your lease. As mm -hmm. I look at these documents, um, this is a letter of intent and not a signed lease. Um, and it's, I would... I do now have a signed lease, but I do not have it with me when I submitted the, the packet, it was a letter of intent. Um, I do have a signed lease, but not with me. Okay, so I would think we would want Maureen you to see that 
Um, because the letter of intent as it stands would have expired by now, which is why I raised the question. The reason that uh, we ask for that is we actually don't want to get in, I mean, unless the board wants to get into it. We usually don't need to get into the terms of the lease. It's, an, it's one of the tools you use to demonstrate right title or interest. Uh, we have occasionally had people who want to come to the board um, and apply for a project on property they don't own and the owner doesn't even know they're having that intent. So the, it's basically the owner showing that they have the right to come forward on property they don't own. So I would say that it was submitted, it was signed, the owner knows about it, and that it, 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 it served its purpose and that it met the right title and interest standard. Okay. But. Personally, to me, the document we have in front of us is expired, yes. so I would make no assumptions based on okay. the document we have in front of us. But if you now have a signed lease, mm -hmm. then you could that, make that occasion. Then I think we would want to see that, which should be no trouble. Okay. Hi. And I'm assuming that if the applicant wanted to block out financial terms, as long as it said that they sure. had the right to lease the space, we didn't need to know the details. Okay. Although I think those are in the letter of intent. Yes. <laughs> okay. Anyone else have any other questions? Would someone like to make a motion? Or did you I, have a question? Yeah. Um, with the sign being removed, does that need to go into any conditions? Or a light being moved to a different sign, does that need to go into any conditions? I would think that that would need to be on the conditions that one of those signs is coming off and that the light would be relocated subject to okay. the applicable sign restrictions. All right. Thank you. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion? Um, I can you make that set? motion or yeah, I Go wrote ahead, that down. Victoria. Did you mm -hmm. No. Okay. Uh, then a uh, motion for approval. Finding a fact, Jacqueline McClure is requesting an amendment to the site plan approval granted in 1988 for 299 Ocean House Road to change the approved use from an office to 840 square foot of combined personal service and restaurant, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulation. Number two, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulation. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, and the facts presented, the application of Jacqueline McClure for amendment to the site plan approval granted in 1988 for 299 Ocean House Road to change the approval use from office to 840 square feet of combined personal service and restaurant be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the site plan be amended to delete the back sign on the existing house. And number two, that a light be added to the plan on the side sign on the existing garage. Did you want to add one about the lease? Oh, and, I, and number three, a copy of the signed lease be included. Or provided to the Be provided to town plan. the town plan. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Liza. Any further discussion? All in favor? That is six of us. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. The next item on our agenda is the short-term rental amendments. The Town Council has forwarded to the Planning Board for review proposed amendments to the Zoning Ordinance to regulate short-term rentals, which is the rental for less than 30 days per tenant of a residential dwelling, Section 1910.3 Zoning Ordinance Amendments. Um, we have spent several workshop sessions on this matter, uh, and the ordinance that we are considering has been amended several times. I thought what I would do is just briefly review some of the highlights of where we are at this point. This is not a formal public hearing, but a public hearing will occur. Um, but we are going to take public comment tonight. So thank you to all of you who have come. Um, Short-term rentals. Short rentals, right. 
We started with an ordinance that was provided to the planning board from the ordinance committee. As some of you know, the ordinance committee itself had had several meetings to discuss that and had quite a bit of public comment and put together an ordinance. We have made a number of revisions to that. Um, we also have received numerous letters from the public, including several today before we came in. We have read all of your letters um, and appreciate your viewpoints, which, as I'm sure you know if you've also read the letters, are quite divergent. Um, I want to make clear the role of the planning board in an ordinance amendment. Our capacity is advisory only. So the final decision that is made here at the planning board is a decision for a recommendation to the town council. It is not final. The town council will then hold, have its own uh, consideration, hold its own public hearings, perhaps send it back to its own ordinance committee. Just wanted everyone to know that this is an interim step, but an important one. And the role that we have as planning board is to look at this question not so much from a balancing political interest as trying to look at what makes the most sense from a planning point of view, from an enforcement point of view, looking at you know, trends as we see them in Cape Elizabeth and in the, in the nation on short-term rentals. So it, it's uh, that kind of substantive review that we as a planning board do and then make our recommendation to the town council. So with that, let me give you just a brief highlight of, of where we are on a number of the questions that have come up here. As the ordinance is now before us, it would permit short-term rentals in all residential districts in Cape, in the BA district, and in the town center, a short-term rental being a rental for less than 30 days. It would require, however, that the minimum term of the rental be three days. So the only thing, the one and only thing prohibited by this ordinance is a rental for a term of less than three days. The ordinance as currently before you applies to all lots within these zones, regardless of the size of the lot, regardless of the residence location of the owner of the lot. This is a change from what came to us from the Ordinance Committee, in part. We have included an exemption from the ordinance for rentals of, for a total of less than 14 days during a calendar year. However, in calculating that 14-day period, any single rental of three days or really between three days and seven days, counts as a whole week. So the 14-day exemption could conceivably be used up by, three, by two rentals, each of which is only three days. So the 14 days could, in fact, be used up in only six days. Um, the number of tenants is a factor of the number of bedrooms in the house, the sanitary and the sanitary waste capacity, but as the ordinance now stands, there is a maximum number of tenants uh, is designated as 10. In addition, there is a maximum of 10 guests allowed on the property at any time. A guest is someone who is on the property but not spending the night. All short-term rentals, other than those that qualify for the 14 days or fewer exemption, require registration with the town. The registration will, would require a physical inspection by the code enforcement officer before the first approval is granted. Thereafter, a physical inspection every five years. In the intervening years, it just requires a certification from the, the landowner that the various issues have been, uh, the various requirements have been met. So an, an approval is for a period of one year with renewal every year, but a new physical inspection by the town only every five years. The registration requirements include a requirement of compliance with specified life safety codes, um, and as you see, there are some alternative ways of drafting that. 
It also requires that certain information be included with every short-term lease. Um, primarily, this information um, specifies the contact information for the tenant and addresses certain life safety issues. So that's a brief summary of where we are. If anyone on the board has anything to add to that brief summary, let me know. Otherwise, I'd like to open the floor to public comment. Um, please limit your comments to a maximum of three minutes per person. Please also know that if you have submitted written comments, we have read them, so you don't need to go through that in detail. But if you do want to identify yourself as here, even if you have already commented, and give us a brief highlight of what you've already submitted in writing, feel free to do that. So, and when you come forward, please identify your name and your address. The floor is open. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for all coming out tonight for this important meeting. I am Tracy Ginn of 5 Seabarn Road, and would like to begin my address tonight by citing an excerpt from a letter sent by a renter, Jim Minot, who had this to say about his week-long stay at our family home. His family, quote, put considerable money into Cape Elizabeth's economy during their stay. Their groceries were purchased from the local supermarket. Gas for the many day trips to enjoy the area was purchased from Jonesy's, and the Good Table Restaurant's dinners provided the folks from away with delicious local seafood, end quote. The info these, for these destinations was made available by my brother David upon rental arrival. This is an important aspect of the current issue regarding short-term rental, rentals in the Cape Elizabeth community. In renting our homes, there is an economic impact that extends beyond the individual taxpayer. Because many of us, and there are many, have chosen to rent our homes as a means of fulfilling our mortgage and property tax burdens. It would not be in our best interest to allow poor decision making and careless renter approval procedures to cause problems that would disallow future rental privileges. The Cape Elizabeth Rental Association was organized by my dear brother, David Ginn, at a meeting in September 2011. David clearly saw the need for all of us rental owners to protect our rights, communicate with each other, and self-regulate what we do to serve us and our community to the best of our ability. At this meeting, David and I learned important lessons. We took note as this seasoned group shared their elucidating accounts of renting for years, and in some cases, generations. Renting is a learning curve, as we wrote in the media. As is everything we do in life, you learn very quickly who to rent to and what not to allow into your home. Considerations regarding our neighbors and our community are essential to this learning process. To quote once more from the above mentioned letter from Jim, I also must compliment David Ginn for providing not only a quality seaside rental for the family members, but also for the strict codes that he has developed to ensure that the rights of the neighbors are protected, end quote. For all the renters in Cape Elizabeth, I have learned this is their number one priority as well. We ask you to look at the record now, straight and fairly, and judge us on our actions, looking toward the future, and given our past. We embody what Cape Elizabeth has long stood for, a proud, vibrant, caring community on Maine's beautiful southern coast, with a sense of pride and ownership on both an individual and community level. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, please. Hi, Stephen Schmidt, 5 Seabarn Road. I just want to take this opportunity to review what steps we've taken to ensure that short-term rentals are not negatively impacting our neighbors. Since the genesis of renting our home two seasons ago, Tracy's late brother, David, had developed strict guidelines for renters, including parking restrictions, limiting the number of cars allowed, noise restrictions, and use restrictions in terms of what the house was to be used for. Um, Mind you, the majority of these restrictions were not required, but rather a proactive approach on David's part. As Tracy mentioned, 
The examples cited in the papers and to this committee were during the early learning curve stages of renting during the first season. Furthermore, these examples have been few in number and have been grossly exaggerated as well. Since then, David and now Tracy and I, um, uh, excuse me. Since then, David and now Tracy and I have learned to delicately <laughs> interrogate our renters prior to arrival about what their plans are. And if we don't, our neighbors certainly will when they arrive. It is proven true when I get calls from slightly unnerved renters, uh, quite often actually, about our neighbors questioning them and actually taking pictures as well. But honestly, we are happy that our neighbors are holding our property to a higher standard. It's for their benefit and for ours, frankly. I don't think anyone would really want their sizable oceanfront home misused or abused in any manner. In fact, we've installed newer infrared cameras on the outside of the house that record 24-7, day and night, what's going on, how many cars are in the driveway, how many people have arrived, how, many, uh, how things are carrying on, uh, so that the, if there is any issue or discrepancy, we can simply go to the videotape. Uh, additionally, we have all, all of us that rent, um, have fairly ironclad rental agreements that prevent any issues, along with sizable binders for renters to refer to, so that our self-imposed rules and regulations are made crystal clear. We really feel that we are going above and beyond to ensure that our neighbors are happy, which is a tall order, and that we are abiding by the current codes in place and are truly self-regulating to a much higher standard that's even required. Even if, it has, uh, even if it's men causing ourselves undue financial harm by turning away many, many interested renters that we feel might be inappropriate. I urge all of you to really do your due diligence on this. And frankly, I think all of us who rent would be happy to give you all a breakdown of what we do, how we self-regulate our own very unique uh, individual, individual properties. Thank you. Thank you. Jean, are we allowed to ask questions? of the people speaking? Um, very limited questions, I think. Go for it. <laughs> um, I want to know how the proposed ordinance, as it stands now, affects you. The only thing that would really affect us is the 10 people limit. We have six bedrooms, so two people per bedroom, 12 people. So that would probably be the biggest thing. Um, other than that, like I said, we've kind of gone above and beyond, so there's really not a whole heck of a lot that's going to impact us other than that. So. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. I, I have one. Sure. Is my okay. how, how does the um, egress and egress about safety uh, affect you? You talk to your um, clients about safety and how to get in and out of the building? Oh, yeah. I mean, we have a big binder that clearly shows here's all the smoke alarms, here's the CO2 detectors in the house, here's um, fire extinguishers, which we purchased many of all over the place. But um, as far as entrance and egress, there's you know, ample doors in and out of the house as well. So, Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, Thank thanks. You. Next person. Good evening. My name is Tom Dunham. We, I look, Sandy and I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lane. We have owned our cottage since 1979, and six years ago when we moved next door, we decided to retain the un, uninsulated structure. We have made significant upgrades and have much more to do. This is not a for-profit decision to rent the cottage. Our only objective is to offset a portion of our expenses and thus willing to give up our privacy to have it occupied a portion of the year. For several workshop meetings recently, the word transient has been used to describe the renters. I find this very offensive, as it is a derogatory description of our guests, and many times those guests quickly become friends of the family. 12 Becky's Cove <clears throat> Lane is a significant family asset. There is no way we would take the risk of endangering others by, by not voluntarily 
adhering to recommended life safety codes. Our insurance, insurance company would demand it. Last, over the past three weeks, we have had a retired headmaster and his wife staying at a, as a guests of our cottage while they renovate their home in Falmouth. Mother's Day, on Sunday, they had a family dinner that include, included 11 family members for a three-hour period. Would the town say no to this event? In summary, I think it comes down to communicating with your neighbors. As you may be finding, it is very difficult to legislate behavior. Our experience has been that most people, and in our case, all the guests that we have um, offered our cottage to, have been respectful of their neighbors and the properties uh, that they rent. We as an association request that we be granted this summer to self-regulate. If circumstances do not improve this summer, then we submit to you that you in turn submit recommendations to the council in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sandy Dunham at 11 Becky's Cove Lane, and we rent our cottage, as Tom said, at 12 Becky's Cove Lane. Uh, we kept the cottage uh, when we built, um, but we soon, it soon became apparent that when we added up the expenses, property taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, improvements, that it was costing a lot to keep a vacant building. We live down a dirt road uh, where it's only our house and the cottage, and we value our privacy very much. We have reluctantly given up some of that privacy to be able to keep our cottage. In the process, we've met some interesting people and made friends with our renters. What I've learned in the short time that we have um, been renting our cottage is that owners want to stay different time periods. Uh, whether that be a, a week or more than a week or a little less than a week. I've turned away many people who want to s rent for less than a week um, because it's a lot of work, extra work for me, if it's less than a week. Uh, however, one of the families who had been with us um, the year before called last summer and wanted to rent a four-day period, a window that I had, that I had, um, and I said, yes, you may, um, because I knew them and um, agreed to do that. So they came, they had a nice time, I cleaned the cottage another time. Under your proposed rules, I would not have been able to make the decision to accommodate the family who wanted to rent the cottage for four days. Our cottage is small with three bedrooms and one and a half baths, and I limit the number of guests to six. I've turned down many uh, families who of more than six people who wanted to rent. However, there was a family of four, including three-year-old twins, who wanted their friends to visit for a few days while they were here. The friends had a child who was seven, uh, who had a child, and so that would make seven. Another time, a couple showed up with their five teenage children, making a total of seven people. In both cases, we made room for the extra person, and, but under your rules, I would have to turn away someone. Um, do you turn away the children, or what do you do? Um, these are judgment calls that should be left up to the homeowner. Each family situation is different, and each property is different. One size does not really fit all. Property owners who live in tightly packed neighborhoods need to make different decisions about their rental property than owners who have more acreage. Some owners want to rent only on the weekends, some want to rent by the week, some want to rent by the month. And I want to thank the Grinnins for bringing attention to the rental properties in their neighborhood. It has started a dialogue am among the homeowners who rent out their properties. Because of the concerns raised, many owners have made adjustments to the number of guests they allow and taken other steps to have less of an impact in their neighborhood. I've noticed rental after meetings, uh, rental owners talking to their neighbors to tr try to work out some of the issues that have been raised. We have formed an association of home, homeowners who rent their properties. There are about 25 people on the email list, and it's growing. We met several times throughout the winter, winter and all in agreement that we want to be good neighbors and that we would like the opportunity to show that we can police ourselves. It really will work better if neighbors in each neighborhood talk to each other to decide what works best for their neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me, Liza? Yep. Um, 
Are you on sept is your rental property on septic? Yes. Okay. And um, I just want to say it's my understanding that the proposed ordinance changes would allow you to have a renter for four days. Correct. Well, there was one discussion at one of your meetings that if you had, you, you could do it for three or four days, but only if you didn't rent the week before or the week after. That's what I understood from your meeting. That, and, and then the case that happened last August, because people wanted it odd times, we ended up with a window. So when the people came for those four days, it meant that it was rented solid. So under what y'all had talked about at the workshop, that wouldn't have been allowed. I know. We did, it, did, you <laughs> did you change it? Did you change it? So we did change yeah. it, Maureen. No, I, yeah. I, I, can, I can envision a scenario where they may have someone who rented for eight days and someone was coming the following week and they have a four or five day window and they would not have been able to rent it. Yeah, see, that's what I was talking about. I can, you know, let's say someone leaves on a Monday and someone else is coming back in on a Friday. And that's so exactly she what happened. Tuesday through Friday morning. Yeah, right. I was looking for the language in here and I Right, why, that's what happened. Where would that be prohibited? Because that, that wasn't my interpretation. Because you, well, what you said is that if you rent for a three day period, that counts as seven days. So in this yeah. it's in there right I now. So I couldn't find it. I could yeah. it's, it's in, that is what you all discussed. It's, it's, under, would, it's where, under applicability. So <laughs> where would that make a difference other than qualifying for the 14-day exemption? Because it would also make a difference because you're saying that you can, your minimum stay is three days, and right. if you rent for three days, it counts as a week. And the idea was you didn't want too many people coming in and out. And if you allowed someone to rent for three days and then for four days, that comes up to seven days, which is one week. But you've actually had two different families move in and out in that one week period. Okay, my understanding was we had changed that so that the only remaining restriction was the, that the, the smallest period could be three days. That was how I understood we had come yeah. out. And that's how I actually read what you had done. So maybe we would need to clarify that okay. point. Yeah. Okay, then that Is everybody? I agree with I, I, Okay, I agree with so I think us. maybe we just need to clarify that. Oh, good. <laughs> sure oh, good, that's very good. <laughs> well, and, and it just happened, and then in our situation, it worked, even though I turn away a lot of people who say they want to come for three or four days. Could, uh, could I ask you why you turned them away? Because it's a lot of tr work for me. You mean preparing, the preparing, project. cleaning, etc. It's not that I, I wouldn't mind them being there, uh, but it is more work. Oh, so it's just a work. Nothing about character. No, no. Actually, we've had been. Uh, I I try to screen people very well on the phone or on the email, and we've been very good that. We have people coming this summer. This is their third summer to come. And most of the people we have coming this summer came last summer. Um, so, I, you know, we're building up a rapport with them. And that's why I let the woman come for the four days, because I knew her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Oh, one more question. Oh, one more question. I'm sorry. Um, the association that you referred to, and I mm -hmm. must say I wasn't aware there was such an we're association. Just forming that. Okay. Uh, have you, do you have any type of a, you know, model codes of conduct or model forms of lease or anything that you've developed for summer rentals? We, um, I think everyone sort of has their own lease. Um, we have talked about, however, at our meetings, um, some of the things that y'all have talked about, uh, about being good neighbors and about self-regulating, about, um, uh, Looking at the number of bedrooms and the number of people who uh, they would rent to, and um, basically doing a number of the things that have been talked about that have seemed to have caused issues. But um, we are we are involved an evolving association, and we have been meeting through the winter, and um, it's sort of forming. So yeah. My name is Chris Grennan. I live at 8C Barn Road. I was unaware we were going to be able to present public uh, hearing here today, but Maureen, my wife, sent a letter today that we are, I, we are strong proponents of the regulations on 30,000 square feet or less. And uh, I came in tonight and listened to uh, 
some of the screening process that's happened on C Barn Road, well, I'd like to tell you exactly what's really happened down there. We've had weddings of 50 people catered in the last two years, arriving on buses, more than one wedding. We've had uh, prep schools showing up from Gould Academy, not one year, but promises made that would never happen again. The next year on long weekends, the bus parking over on the land trust land. I've had brides at my front door knocking to see if they can keep the music going after 10 o'clock at night while my kids are trying to get to sleep to go to school the next day. I mean, these are very small lots down there. We think people coming and enjoying Cape Elizabeth is great, but there needs to be some boundaries. And commercial property is not a boundary, we don't believe, for the small area of Sea Barn Road in the Pond Cove neighborhood. It's been one thing after another. I appreciate the uh, efforts to continue to screen harder, but what's really happened is nothing like what they've said's happened. It's, we've, we've taken pictures based on um, people showing up at the request of the zoning board. Uh, we try to dialogue, uh, get into a dialogue with our neighbors about some sort of limitations. It was a bunch of broken promises and broken meetings, so we eventually felt that we had no alternative but to come to the town and ask for at least some boundaries here so we can enjoy our property as property owners and raise our family without busloads of people and energy every weekend of people coming into town. It really has not been fun. The people that are deriving all the benefits are cashing big checks, but they're not here to police it, listen to the noise. Uh, 18 UVM students with a keg of beer on Labor Day weekend coming out of the trunk. Uh, it's just been one thing after another. So what's actually happened and what has been portrayed tonight is what is happening are two totally different things. Um, when, when the records have been looked at about complaints, right. it's been very sparse. In fact, uh, nobody seems to have had any complaints. Absolutely. But yet, you tell me, um, did, you, did you complain to the authorities and what did they do? We called Bruce. Um, we, sure we didn't call the police. When you're trying to have a dialogue with your next door neighbor that you basically are right on top of, calling the police every weekend. These people that have come here to rent have done nothing wrong other than there's too many people, they're too loud. Uh, we, we, couldn't, we were trying to have a dialogue with our neighbors. Calling the police every weekend doesn't foster much of a foundation to have a dialogue about some sort of limitations and restrictions. So we had no alternative, we didn't think, but to come to the town. I'm, I'm not trying to go into too much detail here, but if there's a noise, it, 11.30 at night, your children are trying to go to sleep. How do you cope with that other than ask uh, ordinance, the police to, to go and ask the neighbors to quieten down? Typically, I've gone over and asked them to quiet down. And, and have they responded to you? Sometimes yes, but a lot of times no. And, and sorry, one more time, and if they didn't respond, did you do anything? Basically closed my windows and knew they'd be leaving in 24 hours or less. Okay, thank you. Why is that the question? So, um, you said early on that you um, are proposing that we limit the restrictions to lots less than three quarters of right. an acre, 30,000 square feet. My question to you is, do you think that the limitations as they are, regardless of lot size, would afford you necessary protections for the full enjoyment of I your think, I think the biggest problem is n sheer numbers. Um, you know, 18 people or 16 people in a, on a small lot with septic. And typically what happens is one family for three or four or five thousand dollars for a week, usually one family is three families full of kids. And so the numbers just keep getting elevated and elevated. That's really where the problem is. It's not one family. It's the family who invites the family and say, oh, why don't you stop by? And before you know it, you have seven or eight cars. They're parking them over at, at the land trust. They had so many people last Thanksgiving, they actually called Mike McGovern to see if they could park here at Town Hall and bring them down. It's just sheer numbers. Yeah. So then they would, probably, given the limitations. I, I haven't ten, read every ten, single ten exact ten. thing. Yeah. I haven't read every single verse and chapter of the Gotcha. It's, I, wasn't really, I wasn't prepared to say anything to right, that. I didn't yeah. know it was a public. It's 10 people plus 10 gate day guests. Right, which leaves a lot of the policing to the neighbors. This whole thing is the policing of of coming up with specific examples for the zoning board was give us examples, take pictures, give us examples. So we did that. Jim Walsh stopped by our house because he saw so many people 
out on the seawall on the beach having professional photos taken, he showed up, there was a 50-person school bus on Seabarn Road, which is about as wide as uh, the three of you sitting side by side. So okay. no that's an example. Restrictions on that area? Uh, Pardon me? Are there no parking restrictions there? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead, Maureen. You need me to pull that mic down. Oh, I'm sorry. No, but uh, I can answer if it's okay on the parking yeah. restrictions. Please do. Um, we've talked to the police chief, and what he has said is that under the current ordinance provisions, <clears throat> as long as a 10-foot wide uh, path is left in the middle of the road, that he cannot do anything more. So you could have cars parked on both sides of the road, and as long as there's a 10-foot wide gap in the middle, that's considered meeting the current road ordinance. On that, spe that's, that's specific to this road is what this, you're talking yes, about, there's not a necessarily few, through the whole town. But, that's, but it's, you, it's like 99% of the town. There are, there are, if I could oh, just, I, I, I understand, I just want to make sure we're clear on this. There are a few roads in town that have very specific restrictions against parking and that's in the road ordinance, but not on Seabarn Road. <clears throat> okay. So, okay. so in our proposal, there's nothing to stop that actually happening if you can't associate it with a rental property. Yes, there, there well, is. Your proposal says that if you are a short-term rental, all of the parking for your short-term rental has to be accommodated on site. But not all your guests. Would you I have to have enough parking I for believe. a total of 20 let's, people if you had? Let's, let's check it right now. The application shall include a depiction of how parking will be provided on the same lot and or include a written agreement for off-site parking at a specified location to comply with the off-street parking standards. Garage parking space is not allowed for tenant use shall not be used to meet the short-term parking requirement. No bus shall be parked at the short-term rental. It's, it could be interpreted to include guests or not include guests, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, looking here, just to follow up on page 11, short-term rental, one space per four tenants with a minimum of two spaces. There's no reference in the specific parking standard to parking spaces for other than tenants. Correct. So I would, I would interpret it as it now stands, not to require specific parking spaces for guests. I would think we'd need to clarify that if that was our intention. Mm -hmm. Okay, next person, please. Um, my name is Sue Gabriel. I live on Wells Road and have actually acquired my mother's home on Kettle Cove Road as well. Two years ago, as a single small business owner, I needed to supplement my income. I chose to rent my house for long weekends as I am often in Vermont. I'm not interested nor am I able to do this for longer periods of time. My home was rented for approximately 30 days through the course of each year. I was careful to select people who would respect the other clear guidelines presented to them regarding my home and my neighbors. They were, the guests, they were fine guests without exception and enjoyed taking advantage of Cape Elizabeth and bringing revenue to the town. <clears throat> Though my home is on a 10-acre private piece of land, I, chose, I choose not to run it for events ever nor do I allow more people to stay in the house and what will comfortably accommodate. This has provided me with a successful solution for my needs as a homeowner without infringing on my neighbors in any way. Last August, my mother passed away and left me her home. <clears throat> Not a very good public speaker. <laughs> and um, on a very small lot in Kettle Cove Road. My decision to rent the furnished home seasonally not only provides supplemental income for me, but allows time for my family to enjoy the home, her home, until a time when one of us will live in the house. During the winter months, the house will be rented for months at a time, preferably for the season. All renters will be carefully selected in respect, with respect to their impact on the neighborhood. Safety issues are addressed through the insurance that I have purchased. This plan ensures that my mother's wishes are met and will enable me to pay taxes and continue maintaining the property 
as she had done very well for, for 30 year, over 30 years. Owning and properly maintaining property is not a simple matter, but definitely, and definitely has many necessary variations. Short-term rentals have proven to be an effective way to ensure that one can succeed in doing that. Most of us have given no reason for our actions to be criticized, much less policed unnecessarily. Our individual reasons for renting are extremely important and shouldn't really be in question. Those of us who do rent are committed to making the rental process continue to work without, within the guidelines that we already have. Thank you. My name is Nancy Ricker, and I live at 27 Surf Road in my property about Two Keys Lane. I have been extremely opposed to short-term rentals because of some of the problems we've had with some of the renters. I have since been able to speak with one of the owners, and she has assured me that she will take every consideration to make things better. I feel strongly that this is the way to handle the situation rather than have the planning board make unnecessary restrictions on people who want to rent their homes but will be perhaps unable to do so with new rules that are made. I just strongly feel that consideration and communication would pretty much take care of everything. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlie Pohl, 39 Old Mill Road, off of Old Ocean House Road. I'm actually a Yarmouth resident, and I'm the only one here speaking tonight who doesn't live in Cape Elizabeth. But uh, the property I'm talking about has been in our family for over 100 years. Uh, we have enjoyed, as a family, being residents of Cape Elizabeth. My mother is 84. She's lived all but about uh, 30 years in Cape Elizabeth and currently lives uh, on Old Mill Road. Uh, we love Cape Elizabeth. I, my sister lives in Baltimore, my brother lives in Scarborough, I live in Yarmouth, and we own this summer cottage that is a marvelous piece of property. We host the Beach to Beacon events entering year number four this year. We bring 700 people in two events to our property to enjoy the scene, be on the water, uh, host, and really kind of open it up. So we help celebrate with the town that great event that Joan Benoit Samuelson brings. Uh, we support and adhere to the, to the current ordinances regarding the use of our property, safety, noise, traffic, respect of neighbors' rights to quiet enjoyment of their home and property. We hear you loud and clear. We understand there is a problem. Um, somebody spoke recently about smaller lot sizes. I have a real problem with understanding how our lot, which is a half a mile away from Old Ocean House Road, it's four acres of, of land, isn't in a neighborhood. It is wide open in terms of, of what we have there. And I, I agree with Sandy Dunham. You can't impose the same condition on a property like that and say all properties are the same, because they're not. And, uh, and the only reason we rent is to help with a very massive tax bill. This property is seasonal. It is maximum three months of the year. There is no heat in this place. And I will tell you, it's uh, you know, well on the way to $40,000 of taxes we pay on this. The only way we can keep it going and not have this land go out of the family is to be able to bring in a couple of renters. Um, like the Dunhams have said and others, we screen people, we, own, we limit it, we try to do everything we can to make sure that we are, are adhering to what the town has on the books today. Um, and so I asked to ask a couple questions. Uh, what does the town not like about the current ordinances that protect the property owner's rights? We have police and code enforcement and some laws that I feel do the job today. Why put another layer of regulation on top of property owners? Uh, and regarding safety, I think a person's life, whether you're a renter, a seasonal renter, short-term renter, long-term renter, or a current resident, safety is safety. Everybody should, should have to live under the same rule and not just as a renter, whether it's um, fire extinguishers, CO2 uh, protection, et cetera, um, uh, uh, fire ladders and so on. What will the new ordinance do and provide that the existing ordinance does not? Um, I've heard a lot said about, and somebody asked recently was, how will this impact you? But it's another layer of regulation. It's more expense to the town to have a code enforcement officer out there when it looks like we already have everything in place, maybe it just needs to be enforced. Um, 
And the other thing is, I don't understand why we have to impose a more rigorous and controlling ordinance. Uh, as I just said, I think, we're, I think we have something that could work. As the Dunhams have said, uh, we've met, we have an organization, we have a group that is, is uh, very committed to seeing that this, that this work failure is not an option as far as I'm concerned and for the property owners. As I said earlier, we've heard you loud and clear and we're ready to go to work to make sure that the uh, rental properties respect the town and the property owner's rights. Thanks. Thank you. Next person, please. Good evening, members of the planning board. I'm Jim Minot. I'm the one who was referred to in the letter by Tr that Tracy spoke about. I live on Beach Ridge Road in Scarborough, Maine, and if you permit a non-resident from Cape Elizabeth to speak at this meeting, then I would be happy to do so and offer a renter's viewpoint about things that are happening along the lines with this, with this ordinance. As Tracy mentioned, when we rented down to the c -Bahn, we brought over some people from California who had not experienced the Maine coast. Absolutely loved Cape Elizabeth. I think one of the most beautiful things that we have in our state are the natural beauties we have and the kindness of the people who live in our state. They found that here in Cape Elizabeth. And it started when we met with David. In June, we met with him. He went over details about what needed to be done if you were going to be a renter in his establishment. There were clear expectations about what would have to be upheld as far as noise, when things had to be quiet around the area, how many cars could be parked in the lot. He emphasized that no more than four vehicles could be parked in that lot. Did we have more people than four vehicles? Not in that lot, but we talked with the town manager ahead of town ahead of time, asked if we could have permission to park right here in this parking lot, shuttle people down, and he said no problem. I would like to think that people who would rent from David would adhere to those guidelines that he had. As far as the nice people that were there, the folks from California and, and I were down there for, for a week, a little bit more than a week and a day, I think it was. We met some awfully nice people. We talked with the people who walked back and forth in front of the Pebble Beach in front of his place. The next door neighbor's golden retriever was a constant person there. And uh, we fed him along with the meals that we had out there. As Tracy mentioned, we utilized the establishments. We bought gas over to Jonesy's, also over to the call station, ate at the good table, ate down to the, sea, uh, to the lobster shack, contributed a lot of money into the economy. I would like to think, as what the previous speaker spoke to, that perhaps that there already are ordinances here in Cape Elizabeth that'll handle some of the issues that are out there. I know most towns have a noise ordinance. I would assume that Cape Elizabeth does. That can be enforced. If people are rowdy after 10 o'clock, that's covered, and that can be attended to, I think, without it. I was really impressed reading over this. You put a lot of time into this, but it sounds like it's gonna be very, very intensive to make sure that all of these things are followed, that all of these things are covered. Boy, it's going to be a, a big process to do this. Traffic and parking, I know that there are, there are ordinances that are there for that. It sounded, from what I heard, that people who are renters and the people who own the houses have some rules that they go by. And it sounded like what I heard is that people are willing to abide by those. And I would urge the council, excuse me, not, I would urge the planning board to look at what is in place right now. Is it working? Can it work a little bit better with a little bit of tweaking before you went to implement a large, large proposal like this one? And again, the folks from California are more than happy. They would love to come back again next year. They loved this town. It says a lot about what you folks have done the things that you've got here for our, for our citizens, as well as the people who come from afar. But thank you, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Right. 
Jim Hubner, I live at 13 Kettle Cove Road. Uh, my wife and I have a short-term rental at 11 Kettle Cove Road right next door. Uh, I have submitted some of my thoughts to the planning board. Uh, I sent it yesterday. I saw Maureen sent it to you today. I'm going to touch on a few. There's not enough time to say it all, but um, I do want to say, I don't remember the gentleman's name that was telling a story about uh, the event uh, in his neighborhood. And as a owner, I'd be, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed that uh, it was a great example of poor tenant screening. And um, that's the first I'd heard of it. It made me mad listening to it that somebody would allow that to happen. But I hope the owner of that property, I don't know if he's here, honestly. Um, I hope he heard it. Hope he hears how mad I am about it so it doesn't happen again. Um, that being said, um, I have read some of the other letters, and I agree it sounded like there were some other jerks uh, at a couple of the houses. But uh, here we are. We're debating this ordinance, which I think is unnecessary. It will only raise taxes, generate paperwork, create hard, feel hard feelings, and won't solve anything. The basis of the ordinance, you're trying to legislate behavior, and it just doesn't work. Every week read in the paper, or every, every courier you read about OUIs, speeding tickets, et cetera. There's laws against that didn't keep them from happening. So uh, I, I just don't understand how this ordinance um, is going to make problems disappear. It's good tenant screening. It's good communication. It's respect for your neighbors. Uh, make sure your tenants know what you expect of them and have them uh, and monitor that. Um, We've all, most of us have had kids, some of them are grown and gone, but we've all heard about parties where irresponsible parents have gone away for the weekend, 500 of your teenager's closest friends have showed up, and there's a party. That was probably not a short-term rental, all right? So, you know, that didn't keep that from happening. There's no uh, ordinance against that. Well, I should say that, underage drinking, yes, there is a law against that. Um, the Gins, you know, they, the, the owners, they, they've learned from their mistakes. They don't intend to let them happen again. We're self-regulating. We've had the, um, the association we formed to keep an eye on things. And also, if you impose these regulations, enforcement's going to be the problem. How do you propose to do that? I went and looked at what's online and all these ordinances that I found have been enacted in the last couple years. And so there's not a lot of history to really judge how effective they are. But I went back and looked at, I found Honolulu, which is not Cape Elizabeth, but it is a bastion of short-term rentals. They imposed ordinances in the 1980s, and um, it really hasn't, it hasn't solved any, um, it hasn't made short-term rentals go away, which is what some of the neighbors wanted. All it's done is owners have uh, exploited loopholes, um, and they, uh, they ignore the ordinance because there's no enforcement. The town can't afford to hire people to enforce it, so they know nothing's going to happen. Uh, in fact, I, I use the example as an article that President Obama, the owner of the house he rents, violates the law every time Obama comes because he rents for less than a month. He rents for two weeks. So that's an example right there of how having an ordinance, it just doesn't work. It all comes down, you're trying to legislate behavior and it doesn't work. It takes the owners talking to the neighbors, um, talking to the tenants, uh, let them know what you expect of them and have no big events. And there has been some good, as we've just said, some, we've, got the, we've got the association that uh, will help police the issue. And as uh, Tom Dunham said, give us a summer, let us see what we can do, and we can revisit the issue in the fall uh, if there are any problems. Thank you very much. Do you have a, if you have a specific question, yes, specific otherwise specific just comments, question. let's wait till the okay. end. Right. Well, it's sort of related. Okay. Otherwise, we won't get through. Yeah, I understand. Go ahead, please. Good evening. 
Um, my name is Patty Grennan. I'm sorry, I didn't really know that there was an open hearing, otherwise I would have prepared some things. Um, I was let me just say, for any of you who don't feel prepared tonight, there will be a formal public hearing. This is in addition to that. This is a public comment period. Okay. So if there's something else that you Yeah, well, I guess what I could say have. is that I want to go on record and say that I am, as um, I live at 8 Seabron Road, I am an abutter to a short-term rental. Um, I am not against renting at all. I want you to know, in general. I am certainly not against renting. I um, am against the idea of um, feeling like um, your uh, relationships or whatever, you, with the people that you aren't there, there are people that come in with a difference of energy. Um, believe me, I have teenagers, I have all kinds of things. The kids come in, they grow up, they do whatever. We have cars, but they come in for two hours. The difference with a short-term rental, there's three things that happen. It's the intensity of the rental. They happen, they, they begin in May, and they don't end till whatever, October. It's, um, they come in Saturday to Saturday. Um, this has been the case the last couple of years. Um, it's the numbers of people. I don't feel like it's reflective of a, a single family. I love a lot of people too, but typically it's not for a long duration with the type of energy of a vacationing energy. Um, and, and, and so intensity, um, numbers, and then, um, and then the amount of cars. Again, they, when they, and, and our neighbors nicely have solved that in a lot of ways. They've put them other places. When we began this dialogue, and we've gone to this place because there wasn't rules around this. I came to the town with the question of what do we do? Had some conversations, they weren't successful. What do we do? Nothing you can do. I'm not sure what's gonna happen going forward or who's gonna own what or whatever. I believe there is a place for short-term renting. What I do want is that when there is um, an issue that someone has a place, there's some rules on the books. That's why I continue to be here and have this dialogue. Um, again, people arrive with a different vacation of energy. They, they come in, it, it's you know, um, night after night. They, you, you can imagine, it's just it's what I would do on vacation. If I spent $6,000, I'm there to have fun. Um, they're not crazy, whatever, but it's, it's not a residential use. It feels like a business to me. So um, that's all I would say. Um, they're, the people who are around are good people. The people who live next to me are good people. It's just, um, it's a conversation that I think um, we need to have, and there's a, there's a balance. And um, um, I guess that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak tonight? Hi, thank you. I'm Liz Hubner, married to Jim Hubner, residents of 13 Kettle Cove Road, and own a small vacation rental so we can pay the rent on it so our kids can live there when they grow up. At, uh, we live at 13, it's at 11. Um, we feel that we really use great discretion with our renters. This is uh, last year was our first year renting. I'm going to kind of go to the more historical side of this piece, but we all know that we live in a beautiful community from the perspective of location, natural resources, warm support of welcoming neighbors. People have mentioned this already. I think Jim Minot did a great job of closing my first paragraph for me, but um, there's several reasons why we all live in Cape Elizabeth. Historically, it was home and host to a large summer population who had cottages throughout the town, including the mountain, ocean, island view, casino, beach neighborhoods, Kettle Cove, Hannaford Cove, Cape Cottage. Um, and I found an excerpt from the history of Cape Elizabeth written by um, George J. Varney in 1886. And it quotes, most of this is kind of fluffy, but this was in this, uh, this uh, publication. Most of the roads bear names well known to the people of the neighboring city whose gay equipages whirl along their smooth lines towards summer residences or some of the numerous points of interest. The Old Ocean House Road, the Hannaford Road, Spurwink Road, and Cottage Road are the principal ones, with the last skirting the eastern shore and affording charming views of pretty cottages and sail-swept sea. 
Well, most people like to vacation in beautiful places like this. Um, so in my lifetime, and I'm thinking possibly many of yours, uh, we've had, I've had the great fortune of staying in another's seaside, lakeside, or mountainside abode for a short period of time to enjoy a vacation in a beautiful locale. And that has helped create many wonderful memories in my life. Um, and I never thought of myself, and I would like to not think of others as transient population as, you know, a renter. That's just a, just a comment. Um, and as an adult, I'm fortunate to be able to provide such experiences to wonderful people who've enjoyed our cottage on Kettle Cove Road. Um, Many of our neighboring communities, Freeport, Brunswick, Scarborough, Portland, uh, South Portland, Bitterford Pool, uh, Gunkwit, uh, York, Yarmouth, um, they all share similar natural resources and they also welcome many summer visitors. Um, and these people who like the people, similar to the people who come in vacation in Cape Elizabeth, return summer after summer and some of those people actually have bought uh, seasonal properties and if, if not have bought, have become year-long residents in Cape Elizabeth and possibly some people in this room have actually followed that path to Cape Elizabeth. Um, so again, I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, talking about we live in a beautiful place that invites people to come and visit and to stay here. Uh, and I know this is not, um, you know, not everybody's against having short-term rentals. I know some people are, but it, it's, you know, it's historical. Uh, I close with a comment from our first tenant from last summer who grew up on Kettle Cove Road in the 40s and had not been back to the neighborhood since uh, early adolescence. And in her little, our little guest book, she wrote, uh, quote, Liz and Jim, you have helped to make a dream come true. Now our grandchildren know what Maine means and insist they are returning next year, end quote. So uh, I think just think instituting strict short-term rental ordinances could result in denial of such opportunities for desired vacation in Cape Elizabeth. And I'd hate to think that I couldn't have a vacation experience on, say, one of the main islands because the owner was discouraged from renting a property due to the burden of strict and unnecessary ordinances which infringed upon his or her common sense management skills. So I think it all goes to the common sense, and that's been brought up today about just screening and good communication with people. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Hi, I'm June Island. Um, I've owned 117 Old Ocean House Road for 22 years now. I began renting it eight years ago in the manner I do today. Uh, the task of fairly re regulating short-term rental is not an easy one. I feel that as this proposal has moved through the planning board, it is expanded beyond its original intent. Specifically, restrictions on number of tenants and guests without account for neighborhood density and inclusion of higher safety standards than for regular rentals or homes. Uh, while leaving a door wide open without restriction for homeowners renting casually two weeks or less with the logic that this would allow Cape residents to help their own personal economies in these tough economic times. I choose to rent my property short term, and the income I get from it has yet to cover all the costs of the associated with owning and property and maintaining that property. But it helps me, the middle class, to be able to afford to keep it for my future use the same logic used for the casual renting exemption, uh, helping our personal economies in these tough economic times. Make no mistake, short-term rental of an entire house is a lot of work. Uh, I spend a lot of time there. I clean it. I... Anyway, as any endeavor, there is a learning curve on all aspects of the rental process. My first year, I was eager to rent, and I found my screening process needed adjustment. Not all tenants are created equal, and my subsequent years of rental have been incident-free as a result. How will the town monitor headcount for tenants and guests at a rental property to determine if numbers have been breached? These regulations are far-reaching, with the potential to fuel more conflict in a neighborhood not happy with short-term rentals. The neighbors saw 11 people at a family barbecue, and even though there's no disturbance or parking violations, we are now held hostage by hearsay and the fear that we will lose our permit and the ability to keep our properties in the manner we have for years. We as landlords make known what can and cannot be done while renting our properties, but cannot ultimately control behavior. We would, 
we should not be held accountable for any misconduct by tenants no more than a rental car company is responsible for a driver speeding. Um, the police should be notified if there is an infraction um, on the books. There is section 1211, disturbing the peace, comes with a fine of up to $250 for any person found to be in violation. State parks, Fort Williams, and Beach to Beacon bring thousands of tourists to Cape Elizabeth each year, so strangers in our neighborhoods is nothing new. My house is on the Beach to Beacon route. Need I say more? In closing, I believe extensive regulation is not required for this use of home and property in Cape Elizabeth at this point in time. I believe that the data driving this regulation is incomplete and biased. I would recommend that the town only instate a free voluntary permit system encouraging even those casual rentals to apply in the name of safety for renters and supply a renter's guide addressing safety and already existing town regulations on noise, parking, and RV occupancy to be included in any rental contracts. Those with complaints about disturbances in parking should, direct, should be directed to call the police and log a formal complaint. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else wish to speak tonight? Seeing no one, then the public comment period is closed. And it's now an opportunity for the planning board to consider where we go. Um, as I mentioned, we do, we are required to have a public hearing on this matter. That's the next step for us to take. We can choose to take the ordinance back to the next workshop and work on it some more. Um, if we are going to have a public hearing at the next meeting, Maureen has suggested that we should decide that tonight and not in a workshop context, that we, we should decide that at the public meeting. So I guess our, the question is, do we want to bring the ordinance as is to a formal public hearing? Are there a few amendments we'd like to make and then bring it to a public hearing? Or do we want to, at this point, bring it back to the workshop? And in considering this, I just want to remind everyone and assure the public that we're considering not only what we've heard tonight, but all of the comments that we have had in the form of emails and letters beforehand, that all of that is part of our consideration, not just the people who happen to be here tonight. Can I make, Henry. A, can I make a comment rather than that decision on the oh, sure. sure. Can I make a comment? Thank you for doing Sorry? Thank <laughs> you. Sorry about that. I thought my voice was loud enough to carry. Not at home. No, not at all. I, mean, I, I listened to all you said with great interest. I actually um, tended to feel that we didn't need this in the beginning, but, but one of the big problems of any decision-making board body is the information of junk in, junk out. Junk data in, you get junk data out. There's no way at the current when, they, when this was brought up, there was, seemed to be no way of determining how many short-term rentals there were other than by following some advert that appeared in possibly in, in the internet. And so there was no way of knowing exactly where the situa what the situation was. Um, I, I listened intently to a number of people that had one or two complaints about the system, but it was greatly outnumbered by the people who were actually renting rather than the people who were complaining. On the other hand, if you don't have any data about the problems, you don't know what to address. You may be told, and as somebody said, it's hearsay. So until that information is put together and some information from that data is gathered, I can't see where there's any difference between the association and what these tentative rules are. I see some conflict of interest in terms of the number of people per size of the house. But the other comment that I had to make is, when you come to talk about the size of a lot, you can't really say, well, there's one rule for this group of people and there's an arbitrary number of 30,000, 40,000, there's another set of rules. You have to be fairly consistent, otherwise you open yourself up to a lot of problems. So whilst I started up by thinking that we shouldn't have too many of this, I tend to agree now that what we've got maybe it needs a bit of work on it, tends to precede together, put together the information and, as the association said, give us a year and we could come back again. I think the same thing is true with the data. 
bring the two together, and at the end of that time, you can have another look at it. But without that, you can't go any further. And one quick comment. You, you can't choose your, you know, if you, if you buy a house or you buy an apartment, you can't choose your neighbor. They could be the neighbor from hell, or they may not be the neighbor from hell. So the point is, well, you know, yes, you have a little bit more problem because more people turn up. But I actually happen to live next to a rental place. I've yet to have a problem at all. But that's just my own personal experience. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment or question? Carol Ann. I wanted to say um, a couple of people mentioned the word transient. We didn't like it either. Just want you to be aware that it's already been removed from what's been written because it does have a negative connotation. And I, it, we, I see this as uh, us needing to go back to workshop, I think. I think we need to take it back to workshop, but I'd also like to have the public hearing scheduled and have something ready to, to go to public hearing in June. Yeah, I, I second Carol Ann's uh, idea. I think we've had some good comment tonight and, and other letters and certainly some tweaking to be done, but I think with a, uh, uh, the next workshop and then the next public hearing, I think we'd be in good shape to come up with a proposal. Anyone else? I would agree with these comments. I'd like to see it go back to a workshop. But go ahead and schedule now that we will do, commit to the public hearing in June. Yes. Okay. So we would release the revised um, standard what, what's the t when would the revised regulations need to be released if we want to go to a public hearing in June? Just give me a moment. So your meeting is going to be June 19th. Uh, your workshop would be June 5th. And, you know, just give me a day or two and we would have the draft amendments probably available June 7th or 8th, which is is more than a week before the June 19th meeting, so we would could have them posted online in advance of a week before the workshop, a week before the regular meeting. And so if people are aware, they're going to be there. We look for them. The other thing I did note, I was looking at them online, and the, the new language doesn't come out as underlined when they put it online, so I'll, I'll work with the webmaster, see if we can make that a little clear, clearer. Oh, that'd be good. The only comment I would make, it seems we have a consensus that we want to go ahead and schedule this for public hearing, but we are going to work on it in our workshop. I take that to mean, though, that what we're expecting is that the ordinance we're going to bring to the public hearing is substantially this ordinance, because I think otherwise what we're proposing really isn't feasible, that what we're intending is to make some tweaks and then bring it to a public hearing. Okay. I guess what I'd like to say for my own part is no one should assume that by doing this that we are indicating whether we would vote ultimately in favor or against the ordinance. Um, certainly for myself, I wouldn't say that. So I think what we're trying to do is move the process forward. As I said, the town council again goes over the ordinance and there's another opportunity to comment. So I think what we're saying is we're ready to move the process to the next step. Doesn't necessarily mean that although we're unanimous on this decision, it is likely that we would be unanimous on the ultimate vote that we would take, just to throw that out there. Maureen. I just want to make clear that you don't have, you really don't have the option to just say stop right now. The council has asked you to make a recommendation, and, and you really are due for making that recommendation. And if the council wants to put a hold on it, then they have the option to do that. But you really are obligated under the ordinance and under the council directive to bring something back to them. You could bring something and say, we don't agree with it, but you can't just stop. So we could not accept the suggestion that we wait through the summer Okay, we're required to give some feedback to the council. Yes, helpful clarification. All right, so do we do any kind of a vote to schedule it for a public hearing? You make a motion, yes. All right, would someone like to make that motion? That, Carol Ann. Motion for the board to consider. 
Motion to table to public hearing. Be it ordered that based on the materials reviewed and the facts presented, the Planning Board tables the short-term rental amendments to the June 19, 2012 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Is there a second? <clears throat> that doesn't mean if it's tabled, does it, Maureen, that we cannot discuss it at the workshop? No, you can still discuss it at the workshop. Okay. And you can even announce your intention right now, just so it's clear that you will be discussing it at the workshop. I think that is our intention. Yeah. Any further discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous, all seven of us. Thank you all for coming. Please feel free in the interim to send us written comments, and we will see. We will be back here again in June with a formal public hearing. Thank you. Yeah. Yes.